there it is. That's a pretty good sermon. I guess we could go home now. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Dennis. I'm glad to be back with you. Let's open our Bibles together to Revelation chapter 2. If you didn't bring a Bible or don't have an app on your phone that you typically use, there's a Bible in the pew rack there in front of you. The book of Revelation is the very last book in the New Testament, so at the back of that Bible, chapter 2, I'm going to bring you to our text of study. I want to introduce our, our time of study together uh, just by a common statement that uh, my boys, when they were growing up, and my grandsons, I've got four grandsons, are, are like every other kid, uh, for some reason, boys love knives, swords and knives. They'll pick up sticks and start whacking each other. Anybody, you know, yeah, it's all the same. Well, with my son's permission, when my, my grandsons were little, I made them some swords out of wood that were real dull, couldn't do anything. I made these little knives that were real dull. They could, And the whole point of it was to try to teach them to be responsible with something that could eventually hurt them if they misused it. And so uh, we just wanted to see if they could uh, withstand the temptation to go around stabbing each other and their sister, for sure. So uh, we made these, and lo and behold, my grandsons are pretty responsible kids. And as a result, many years later now, they each have received a knife. So now they can cut off their fingers for real. But I don't know, good parenting decision or bad decision? I, I, I'm not sure we would all agree with it at all, but I, the, the decision was made based upon a principle from the Bible that gets repeated often, uh, simply stated, it's that if, if a person is responsible or faithful in smaller things, she or he typically will then be responsible in much larger things in the future. And uh, uh, Jesus said it, use it almost those exact terms in Luke chapter 16. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. What's he saying? If you're dedicated to the Lord Jesus in following in some of the minor challenges, it's a pretty good indication that when those bigger challenges come down the road, you'll be faithful as well. But if you're irresponsible in the smaller things, there's no way you're going to stand up to the bigger challenges when you face them in the future. So the principle is simply this, faithful in little, faithful in much. Now, the reason I want to emphasize that is because that's going to be the challenge that we're going to get as a result of reading this text in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Before we look at it, let me just give you the quick overview. Pastor has been teaching us about this book of Revelation. Chapter 1 is all a description about Jesus, where the Apostle John receives a vision from an angel about Jesus. And that's the description of our Lord all in chapter 1. And John, according to chapter 1, verse 11, was to write down this vision and send it to seven historic churches in what was then called ancient Asia Minor, that is modern-day Turkey. And there are these seven historic churches here that you're going to be talking about in the, in the weeks to come. Well, in chapter 2 and 3 of this book of Revelation, Jesus also reveals his spiritual evaluation of each of these individual churches. And he, he's going to going to tell them, here's what I think of where you're at. And that evaluation is meant not just for them in the first century, but for the Orchard Church in 2024. And the reason that we know that is after each one of these evaluations that the Lord makes of these seven churches, he says, uh, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what Jesus says to the churches, plural. So what he wrote to Ephesus is meant to be read at the other six churches. 
And the same with every single one of those. So what he says back in the first century is meant to evaluate you and me and us, both individually and as a church. And last weekend, pastor spoke about the church at Ephesus and how it had left its first love. It, it, w- it was orthodox, what it taught, but the heart had grown cold to the things that Jesus loved, which was true worship and the lost. And so he called them, get your act together and repent. Soften up that heart. Return to your first love. That's the message to the church at Ephesus. And it was a message for Orchard Church as well. Well, now we're going to come to this second church. Uh, it's the church at Smyrna. Say that name with me. Smyrna. Smyrna. It comes from the word myrrh. Myrrh was a perfume at the time. It was used. It was an embalming perfume. Uh, that's what this, one of the things that this city was famous for. It was a beautiful city. Lots that we could talk about. But the one thing you need to know about ancient Smyrna was the people in this city worshipped a number of gods, Zeus, Aphrodite, uh, the god of healing named Asclepios. Asclepios symbol is a pole with a snake on it. And the AMA, the American, American Medical Association, still uses that symbol for the god of healing. Okay. They worshipped Asclepius as, as a god, but they were fanatical, absolutely fanatics about worshipping the Roman emperor as a god. Sounds crazy, but that's what they did. And this is a picture of Tiberius Caesar. They built him a temple where they would come in and worship before a statue or some kind of an idol. They would burn incense, maybe sacrifice an animal. All of this God. And uh, the, the church was, was under constant pressure to join this worship. Particularly because just a few years before this letter that we're about to read um, was uh, received and, and read in that ancient church, the emperor Domitian uh, made it a capital offense, punishable by death, if you did not make a yearly sacrifice in front of the statue of Caesar. So they lived in that environment every single day of their lives. That's the background fact you need to know about Smyrna. Now, knowing that now, listen to what Jesus says, because he's going to evaluate them. Here's his perspective. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And to the angel, the messenger of the church in Smyrna, write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Now there's a lot in here. Uh, The very first thing that, that we notice right off the bat is that Jesus knows all about what they're going through. He knows it all. Uh, Verse 9 is is really clear. I know your tribulation, your affliction. Literally, the word is pressure. I know the pressure that you're under because the the people of Smyrna were dedicated to this worship of this emperor, and they were saying to these Christians, why don't you come? Why don't you come and make this offering? Why don't you come and make this sacrifice? Why don't you go into the temple and say that Caesar is Lord? And the Christians are going, no, we can't do that. So the the, the pressure was constant. Constant. Because they they were saying, listen, if you don't do that, it's a 
an act of treason. You are a terrorist. You are not a patriot. You don't come in and do that. Wow, kind of crazy. So this pressure, continual pressure, and as a result, one of the biggest pressures was financial. Thus, verse 9, he says, I know your poverty. Uh, there are two different words used in the Bible for, for uh, being poor. One is just ha not having resources. The other is to be a, an absolute beggar. That's the word that he uses here. He says, I know the price financially you have paid for not going into that temple and burning incense in front of a statue of Caesar. I totally get it. Now, we don't, we don't know how they lost all their money, but they did. Were their shops boycotted? They couldn't get materials from their suppliers, the manu manufacturing supply chain issues. Uh, their accounts receivable never got paid. They get blackballed in their uh, environment that they, that they worked in. We don't know. Oh, I know, it just cost them everything. Jesus says, I know. I know all about it here. I know, verse 9, about the slander of those who say that they are Jews but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So not only was the pressure coming from the Romans in Smyrna, also coming from the Jewish community. They, they slandered. Literally, it's the word blasphemed. That's how, that's how intense it was, how wicked it was. And we know that the Christians, early on in history, were all accused of being cannibals because of a misconception of what it meant to celebrate the Lord's table or communion, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And, and you know, in our culture today, the, the things that get said about you, if you say that you're a Christian, that you say that you're an evangelical, you're immediately labeled, categorized as a wacko. And that's why a lot of people won't say that they're Christians anymore. Especially not an evangelical Christian. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. I know the slander that you're going through. It happens. Uh, verse 10, behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Um, in New Testament times, prison was not for punishment. You need to understand that. The Romans had no interest in paying to incarcerate criminals. So if you went to prison, you were awaiting trial for three outcomes. First, you would be fined, or exiled, or executed. So that's what these folks were facing here. And I, I, I've never faced that. I've never faced anything like that. I don't know whether you have or not. And Jesus just says, it's just Satan doing what Satan's always done. He wants to sift you shred you, ruin you. That's what he demands. You. It's like a roaring lion seeking some woman, some man to devour. The enemy of your soul is after you. He's after these folks here. That's why the Apostle Paul, he spent a lot of time in prison. He got arrested over and over and over again. So, many believers... Throughout the word. What's the point? Jesus says, hey, I, I, I'm not unaware. I know what you're going through. And thus the question is, why doesn't he stop it? It's because he has a purpose for it. Verse 10. Okay. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Not bad luck. Not bad karma. It's a test. And the whole point of it is this. It's to strengthen your faith. And maybe even more to the point, to prove that your faith is real. Because I can stand up in front of you and tell you I'm a follower of Jesus, no problem, when there isn't any cost to it. But 
when the issue is, get up here and say that Caesar is Lord, or else you won't eat. That's a whole other story, isn't it? Well, that's what these folks are going through here, and it was just a test. And when, when typically are we closest to the Lord? When we go through trouble, when our kids are sick, when our grandkids are sick, when there's no medicine, there's no diagnosis, the doctors, they're just practicing medicine anyway. They haven't perfected this thing. <laughs> Boy, our hearts just cry out to the Lord. So there's a purpose to it all. And if you, if, if you read through uh, the history of Christianity in the world today, the times when the Christian faith was most powerfully presented and it spread the deepest and most quickly was during times of persecution. In, in China, just 50, 60, 70 years ago, they kicked all the Christians out, all the missionaries out. They killed most of the Christians. And the church went underground, facing horrible persecution. And what happened to the church? The church just spread like crazy. Just like crazy. And I tell you this, the same exact thing is happening today in Iran. The church is growing like crazy, all underground. And the reason for it, and it's the Roman theologian Tertullian, his famous statement, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's always this connection between hardship and growth, between difficulties and spiritual deepening. See? And that's the whole point of why he allows this. That's why I've used the acronym SBIGO a number of times here before. Say SBIGO with me. SBIGO, S-B-I-G-O. Something bigger is going on. Every problem you face in life, something bigger is going on, and the something bigger has to do with the development of your character and your faith. Will you trust me or won't you? And that's what's happening here. Peter says that trials are necessary. We rejoice even though for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Why? So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus comes back. What do you think he's going to value more, your portfolio or your faith? And it's not that the portfolio is unimportant. Nobody is saying that. We're just explaining to you why sometimes your portfolio is empty. Because Jesus is going to say, are you going to trust me or not? What's really valuable to you? See? And this is a question that gets asked over and over and over again. People here. Why am I going through it? It's so that your faith will grow. Be proven true. That's the Old Testament character named Job. And he just, he got hammered. His attitude Job 23.10, he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. And all of those other less valuable minerals get burned off. And then there's a purity of faith that comes. So, no different for us. So I don't know what you're going to face today or any day this week until we gather again next Lord's Day. Just know this. Jesus knows about what you're going to go through. He knows. He has a purpose for it. And he actually cares that you're in the midst of it. That's why this description of Jesus is given in verse 8. To the angel or the messenger of the church in Smyrna, write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Two titles. He's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the A to Z. What's he saying? I was there before Caesar. I'll be there after Caesar. 
I've been with you in the past. I'll be with you in the future. You don't have to worry. I have seen it, and I know it, and I will walk with you through it. The afflictions, the persecution. And we all know that when you have somebody with you on the journey, it changes everything. T.A. Webb said this way, that a journey shared is a burden halved. And Jesus says, I'll be with you, no matter what you go through. I'm the first and the last. And he says, I know what it means to suffer. His second title, who died. What did Jesus do? He made a stand for God. And what did it do? Got him crucified. He said, I get it, making a stand for God. But what you need to know is, I didn't stay dead. Who died and came to life. And that's the whole point of it. The suffering did not conquer him. He conquered it. And that becomes our consolation. His victory guarantees our victory. Nobody faces death without some fear and trepidation. You know, I, I'm not afraid of death. It's the dying part that I'm not too crazy about. But there's always this little bit of fear of trepidation, but it's his victory that guarantees our victory. Because I live, he says, you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you are going to live too. I was, I was just up with a friend yesterday dying of cancer, just has a few days left to live. And through the tears and the pain and the anguish of her husband and kids and grandkids and brother and dad, There's hope. There's hope. And that's what Jesus is saying here. No matter what we've been through in the past, or what we're facing right now, or we'll face in the future, Jesus is there with you, and 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 you. I'm with you. And I understand your pain, and your pain, and your pain, and your pain, and your pain. I get it all. And I'm here to help you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. The writer of the Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 18, said, See himself has gone through suffering and testing. He's able to help us when we're being tested. This is not somebody just in the ivory pulpit here. This is a man who's been crucified and conquered it. And he says, I can help you. That's why he says, verse 9, you, you, I know your poverty, but you're really rich. You've been born again. You have a living hope. You have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. You're protected by the power of God. You have treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not, does not destroy One day we'll all get to share in everything. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for yours, your sake, your sake, your sake, your sake, your sake, your sake, he became poor, so that you and you and you and you, through his poverty, might become rich. Right? His victory guarantees our victory. So, I'll just add, Jesus proven you, testing you. You really believe this Jesus stuff? That he's alive, risen from the dead? You really believe that? You believe that he's coming back? If you do, hang on. Hang on. Your suffering won't last forever. Whatever you're going through, it's not going to last forever. That's why he says, uh, verse 10, you're going to have, uh, for 10 days you will have tribulation. Don't know if that's a literal 10 days. Don't know if it refers to a short period of time. 
or some 10 periods of persecution, lots of different opinions on it, on it. What Jesus is saying is, listen, I know when this trouble started. I know when it's going to finish. I know it's beginning. I know it's end. And I have a plan and I have purpose for the whole journey. And it's a good purpose. All my life you've been so faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Do you believe it? Come on. Do you believe it? If you do, here's his command to you, verse 10. Don't fear what you are about to suffer. Things might be bad now. It's going to get worse. When you read through the book of Revelation, things are going to get worse. And if our understanding of Revelation 13 is correct, some point in time, Christians are going to have to decide. Do you want to eat or do you want to follow Jesus? Something having to do with the number of the beast and forehead and on the hand, whatever that means. Some point in time. And Jesus just says, Don't be afraid. For me to live is Christ. And we say this, you know, we can say, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on that. But we'll never go through this. Odds are. North San Diego County, we're not going to get put to the test like this. But it doesn't mean we don't have fears. I mean, we could, hospital stays, who doesn't fear that? Medical, dementia, you get, we get a little bit older and the forgetter starts working better and better all the time. Am I going to be able to provide for my family? What am I going to do for my grandkids? How's anybody going to afford a house? North County. He says, don't be afraid. Verse 10. Be faithful unto death. And you have to take that in the context again. No matter what torture they inflict, what pain, what pressure, no matter what they take away from you, be faithful unto death. And I, I'll just tell you again, I, I, I don't know what I would do. I have no idea. I hope I would do that. But I have no idea. And none of us do. Because that all has to do with tomorrow. And thus, I'll, I'll, let me come full circle and bring it back to the principle. Faithful in little, Faithful in much. So the real question, are you going to lie today? Or are you going to tell the truth? This week, you students, are you going to cheat? Are you going to report all your income? Are you going to open your mouth and witness to somebody about Jesus? Or are you going to stay quiet because you don't want to cause any ripples or cause any? See, I don't know whether I'd be faithful unto death. I just want to be faithful tomorrow as I live. And that's the choice that you and I and we get to make today for all of this afternoon and for every day this next week. Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? Amen. Come on. Did you come to hear from the Lord? Yes. Yeah, be faithful today. Commit yourself to the Lord today. Are you a follower of Jesus of Nazareth or aren't you? And if you are, then plant that flag and stand by it. Most of you have done that. If you haven't, it's never too late to do the right thing. 
I saw this quote from author Marianne Rodmacher that I like, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I'll try again tomorrow. I may not have lived up to it today, but tomorrow's going to be a new day. And for some of you, it's time for you to make that commitment to the Lord Jesus that you'll make a stand for him. And then the proof will be in the pudding. If you do, verse 10, be faithful under death. I'll give you the crown of life. I'll give you eternal life. They might take your life down here, but I'll give you eternal life. That's what's promised to every single one of us who perseveres under trial. Once you've been approved, you'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You love the Lord Jesus? I know most of you do. Then follow him. Today. Follow him today. And if there's pain that comes as a result of it, just understand. Whatever affliction you're going through right now, it doesn't compare to the blessings that God has for you in the future. So live for the Lord today. Make account today. Stand up for Jesus today. Regardless of what anybody else does. Are you listening? Verse 11. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen with your mind and with your heart. Verse 11, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The first death is physical death. That hurts. It's the second death. Eternal separation from God in a place called hell. You stay faithful to the Lord today and strive each and every day. Stay faithful to the Lord. That second death won't hurt you at all because your, tev, your faith will be proven true, proven genuine, proven real. So, you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Not, not just going to church, kind of following Jesus, but I mean really in your heart of hearts, whether anybody else does this or not, the decision is up to you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And it's time for some of you to make that commitment. Be real about it and start living it out to the best of your ability. Because that's really the history of the church at Smyrna. They were living it out. And maybe the greatest example of it happened maybe 50 years after this letter was read in the, in the church. Very likely that there was a young man in that church who heard this letter read for the very first time. His name was Polycarp. Uh, he was a disciple of the Apostle John. And John taught him well. And the persecution in Smyrna got worse and worse and worse until an edict came down that said, uh, you either do this or you're going to die. And so the leaders of the church of, of the uh, city of Smyrna came to Polycarp and they said, you've got to go into that temple and say, Caesar is Lord and burn incest to him or else you're going to die. And Polycarp re responded. They actually have a record of his words written down. Eighty and six years have I served him. He's done me no wrong. How can I then blaspheme my king and my savior? And they took him out and they burned him at the stake. The first death was horrible. The second death wouldn't touch him. What are you living for? First or second death? And may the Lord give us grace to live this up. I'll ask you. 
you know the Lord Jesus, Jesus saved me. I'm so sorry. I've screwed up. I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe you. I really believe you. You died for me on that cross, Mount Calvary. I get Good Friday that you were buried. I believe that. I believe Easter Sunday is true, that you rose from the dead and you're alive October the 13th, 2024. And I want you as my Savior. Not my family Savior. Not my Savior. Please, Jesus, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I want to follow you as my Lord. Anybody this morning? You may be in church all your life, but it's time for you. I hope you will. For those of you who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, are you living it out? Be faithful today. It's good for all of us to reaffirm our commitment if we know and love the Lord. Follow him with his help today. All right, let's pray. Together. All right, everybody take a deep breath together, will you? You've been patient with me and a lot of words I've used up here. So what's the, what's the Lord saying to you this morning? Anybody for the first time, Jesus, save me, forgive me. Come into my heart. I want to follow you. Be my Savior and my Lord. I Please. You make that the decision. Tell somebody today. Tell somebody. Be faithful today. Make your commitment, won't you? Our Father, uh, I, I just would admit to you, I'll, I'll make a mess of this today if you don't help me by your Holy Spirit. Because I and we together, we really want to honor you by honoring your Son. And so, Lord Jesus, and I pray that your Holy Spirit and your Word would help me, my sisters and brothers in Christ, help us hear our prayer, hear our commitments. We know that you're faithful. So empower me and us today, please. Be faithful to you. So help us, Lord, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.